this afternoon. We'll find our text as, as we confess it and it has been summarized in Lord's Day 19, in which we're dealing with the fact that our Lord Jesus ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God and that he will come from there and to judge the living and the dead. And so we'll, we confess the, the following in Lord's Day in 19 on page 533 of your book of praise. And there we c- confess, first of all, why is it added, we're dealing here then with the Apostles' Creed, and sits at the right hand of God, the Lord Jesus, and sitting at the right hand of God. And the answer, Christ ascended into heaven to manifest himself there as head of his church, through whom the Father governs all things. How does the glory of Christ our head benefit us? First, by his Holy Spirit, he pours out heavenly gifts upon us, his members. The second, by his power, he defends and preserves us against all enemies. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven, the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the previous Lord's Day, in Lord's Day 18, which we dealt with last week, we confess that the Lord Jesus ascended up into heaven uh, with his human body, the body that was raised from the dead. And so the one who uh, descended from heaven is now also the one who has again ascended into heaven after he won the great victory over sin and over death on the cross and in his resurrection. And so we confess that our Lord Jesus is the one who defeated the powers of darkness and he has entered into heaven as the great and the victorious the king of all the earth. And when he entered into heaven, our Lord Jesus had access to his Father in heaven, which means that he is able to to plead for our life. He's able to make intercession for the life of his people for whom he shed his blood. But the Lord Jesus also already promised his disciples that when he goes into heaven, he says, I go there to prepare a place for you. But I also will not forget about you. I will send you my Holy Spirit who will dwell in you, and he will constantly also give you the strength that you may seek the things that are above in heaven rather than the things that are found here in this earth, things that will all pass away. And so when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, we know how the Father, his Father received him with open arms, and he set his Son on the throne at his right hand. Now, before all of these things actually happened, before they all took place, uh, namely his ascension, his being seated at the right hand, and his return from heaven, first of all, we need to back up, and we need to see the Lord Jesus standing in front of the Sanhedrin before those spiritual leaders of Israel who have accused him of wrongdoing and who will also here accuse him of blasphemy against God. You see, when the Lord Jesus was arrested and he was placed on trial, uh, the leaders of Israel, they saw a poor and a humble man who they thought was making blasphemous claims that needed uh, to be punished. And so it comes a a point before that that the high priest asks the Lord Jesus and he puts him under oath and he says to the Lord Jesus, Are you the Christ? And we mean by the Christ, you could also say, are you the Messiah or are you the Savior? And then he goes on, he says, and and are you the Son of God? And the Lord Jesus replies, yes, it is as you say. And then the Lord Jesus continues and he adds these words. He says, in the future, literally, actually, he says, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One in heaven and coming on the clouds of heaven. So you notice the Lord Jesus says to, the, to these leaders of Israel that from now on, I am moving from a position of humility here in front of you uh, to a position of great honor and glory. 
Soon you're going to nail me to the cross. There I will be come under the, the curse of God because I'm hung on a tree, dead. But you know, my suffering is going to open up for me the way to great glory with my Father in heaven. And so from now on, the Lord Jesus says, I am moving from a position of humility uh, to one of great authority at the right hand of the mighty one in heaven. And from there, I will come as the great judge of all the earth. Now, of course, we know that the Jews who listened to him were not very happy with him, and they became very angry and they accused him of blasphemy. But for the Christian believer, this is a joyous confession. For in faith, we now see our Savior as the one who is ruling over the whole earth from heaven. And, and we believe that one day he will also again return from heaven to this earth to come as the judge of the living and the dead. And when he comes, he will establish the kingdom of God here on this earth in all of its glory. And so this afternoon we'll confess God's word under this theme. The Son of Man rules and judges the nations. So our, our theme this, this afternoon is the, the Son of Man, which is the title that the Lord Jesus gives to himself and places upon himself, a title that comes, we'll see in a little while, already out of the Old Testament. And so the Son of Man rules and judges the nations. We're going to look at two things, or two points under this theme. First of all, we see that the Son of Man sits at the right hand of the Mighty One. And secondly, that the Son of Man is coming on the clouds of heaven. The leaders of the Jews... They saw the Lord Jesus as he was preaching and traveling about the land of Israel as a threat, a threat to their own leadership in Israel. Remember that when the Lord Jesus put on trial, that earlier in that same week, the Lord, the Lord Jesus had come into Jerusalem riding on, on a donkey in glorious procession, and, and the people welcomed him with open arms, and, and they were ready to crown him as their great king. And the leaders of Israel, they were uh, afraid when they s heard this and they saw this happening. And they thought, no, this Jesus, he might lead a great uprising, a great rebellion against the Romans. And if that happens, that's going to jeopardize our position. It will upset that cozy relationship that we have with our Roman rulers. But how to get rid of this troublemaker, this man who could upset cozy relationship that they had with the Romans. Well, they, they needed grounds on which they could condemn him and which they could put this troublemaker to death. But they bring forward all kinds of witnesses, all kinds of false witnesses. None of, those wit none of the, the charges were able to stick. And in the midst of, and, and through all that time, we're told that the Lord Jesus remained silent. He refused to say anything. He refused to speak up in, in his own defense. Why? Because he also believed, he knew that this was his father's will, that he should give his life on the cross. So he wasn't going to defend himself as being innocent. He was ready to give his life on the cross for the life of his people. And so there comes a point where we were told by Matthew that Caiaphas, the high priest, who is presiding over this, this ruling, over this, this judgment, he became exasperated with the Lord Jesus and by his silence and so finally, he says to the Lord Jesus, now, now answer me under oath. Under oath, tell me, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Savior? Are you the Son of God? Now, there are those commentators who think that or argue that Caiaphas probably did not understand the term the Son of God to literally mean God's Son but simply as a title for the one who would come as the Savior of Israel. And that might indeed be the case. We don't know exactly what Caiaphas was thinking in his own uh, mind. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's the title Son of God could also sometimes also be used even for the people of Israel. And so, and so uh, he may have, Caiaphas, may, Caiaphas may have thought about that title in terms of the Messiah and the Savior who was coming. But what is clear is this is that Caiaphas asks whether he is, Jesus is really the one that God promised long ago who would come as the great king and who would come as the ruler of Israel. Is he the one that God said would be the savior of the people? And Jesus answers, uh, gives an answer to Caiaphas. Now, his answer is not as clear as you find in our translation. 
uh, in the NIV, it says, yes, it is as you say, uh, but literally it says, you, you say so. In other words, Jesus says, um, those are your words, they're not my words, but the implication is, yes, your words are right. Um, Jesus doesn't deny uh, the, what Caiaphas says here. But the Lord Jesus goes on and he adds these words, and he says, but from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So picture the situation here. The Lord Jesus standing here before the Sanhedrin, before this court. His hands are, are bound because he's been arrested. And he stands before them in the greatest humility, accused of wrongdoing. And these leaders, they, they truly believe with their whole heart that he is worthy of death and he's worthy of God's eternal judgment. But now here is this man who stands before them and who now finally speaks. And now he finally opens his mouth and, and he says to them, And from now on you will see me in glory, seated at the right hand of Almighty God, and I will come on the clouds of heaven to judge, to judge you. Well, I think if you understand the scenario, what's going on here in this courtroom, you can imagine why Caiaphas became blazed, became angry, and he accuses Jesus of blasphemy. Will this man, will he claim that he is the Christ? Will he claim that he is the Savior? Will he claim that he is the Son of God? Will he claim the throne at God's right hand? And will he make a claim that he's going to be the judge of the whole world? Well, look, when he's standing here condemned and under the curse of God, what blasphemy this man is spouting. Well, when you listen to these words of the Lord Jesus, keep in mind the Lord Jesus is referring back to some words that are found in the Old Testament. He's referring to the words that are found in the vision that Daniel received in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel uh, there receives a, receives a vision from God. And in verse 9 of that chapter, he tells us that he sees uh, in that vision thrones were set up in, the, in, in heaven. And he also saw the Ancient of Days, who is, of course, Almighty God, taking his seat there on the throne. And then he goes on and he says in verse 13, I, I also saw before him like one, one like a son of man. Notice the title, the son of man, coming on the clouds of heaven. And he approached the ancient of days, that is the eternal one, the almighty God, and he was led into his presence. And then Daniel says in verse 14, and then he saw, I saw that the son of man is given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and people from all nations come, and they worshipped him. So you notice then, if you understand this vision, that the Lord Jesus now, in the midst of his humiliation and suffering, uh, says to, to the leaders of Israel in this courtroom, I am the Son of Man that Daniel saw in his vision. And from now on, you will see me seated there at the right hand of the Mighty One as the one who has been given authority and glory and sovereign power. So you notice what the Lord Jesus is doing here? You notice that he's proclaiming his victory to those people, those leaders who, who want to see his destruction. And he wants to make very clear, he says, my victory is going to come by traveling down the path that must go uh, through the cross of Golgotha. Well, to understand what it means for the Lord Jesus to be seated at the right hand of God, we need to get, take a little closer look at the vision that Daniel receives. Chapter 7, Daniel saw, he says, four winds, uh, the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. And I also saw, he says, four beasts coming up out of the sea. The first beast just was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. The second beast was like a bear, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. The third beast, well, it was like a leopard, and it had four wings on its back. And the fourth beast was terrifying and frightening and very powerful, 
It crushed and it devoured its victims and it trampled underfoot whatever was left. Well, as we look at that vision, you need to understand that the sea that Daniel sees represents the humanity of this world. In the Bible and the scriptures, the sea is often used as an image for this world in which we live and the peoples of this world. And so just as the sea is being churned by the four winds so that the waves of the sea are crashing back and forth, so you can say the peoples and the nations of this world are in constant ebb and flow, constantly seething back and forth, always restless. The world that we live in today, we can still say, is, is a restless world when you see all the things that are happening. You hear the news, and you know, sometimes you get this impression, man, this is a restless world, all kinds of Crazy things are happening, all kinds of violence happening all over uh, the place. And it never seems to end. That's what the sea represents. The restlessness of the peoples of the earth. The four beasts represent four kingdoms that will uh, arise from uh, the people of the earth. And when you look at the vision and you see its interpretation, you'll notice that the lion represents the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, the bear will represent the Medo-Persian the Medo Empire. The leopard will represent the Greek Empire. And the terrifying beast, the last one, represents the Roman Empire. And so already in the days of Daniel... God shows in his vision that one empire, one kingdom will arise and then the next one comes and it will destroy the one before it. And so the reality in this world is that there is a, a vicious cycle taking place. Kingdoms and nations, they devour and viciously destroy one another. As I said today, you still see that there is a constant cycle of violence and destruction happening throughout the world. Now back in my youth, it was the time of the Cold War with the communists over against the Western world. And there were also these hot spots, these flashes of, of fighting in different parts of the world between these two uh, powers. Some time ago, maybe 15 years ago, there was conflict in the Balkans, and that was the hot spot. Today, you can say the hot spot seems to be the Middle East, but you also find that there's violence in so many of the parts of the world today as well. And nations do not only fall as a result of warfare being destroyed by another nation, but nations also fall or end up in turmoil because of deteriorating economic conditions. You find that throughout history, uh, that civilizations imploded when uh, their economic conditions uh, became uh, fell apart and we'll see the same thing happening even today in the western world in which we are living in which it seems like the debt under which our our nations today are living eventually will cause the implosion uh, of these nations but now over against those kingdoms of this world that daniel sees here in verse 9 thrones are set in place and the ancient of days whose god took his seat and when it refers to ancient of days, ancient of days, another way of describing God is the eternal one, the one who is from eternity. And so also God's greatness, God's majesty, his power comes out in the description uh, that Daniel gives us of, this, uh, of the ancient of days. He says his clothing is as white as snow, his hair is white as wool, his throne is flaming with fire, and its wheels are all ablaze. And there are thousands and thousands of angels, Daniel sees, who are attending him. And so what Daniel sees in this vision, then are, are thrones set up here on this earth, kingdoms on this earth, and there's one throne uh, in which one throne is being uh, overtaken by the next one, where one kingdom is destroyed by the next kingdom. And so Daniel sees on the one hand, there's nothing permanent about the kingdoms here on this earth, and yet at the same time, there is a progression among these kingdoms. Because these kingdoms of this earth, they increasingly become more and more hostile against the Lord God. And that's why that fourth beast is described as a terrifying beast. It had ten horns. Horns are symbols of power. And so ten horns symbolize great power. But Daniel also sees that from them there arose another horn. And this is a little one. 
a little horn that had the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Well, you know, it talks about a little horn, and there's probably some cynicism here or some irony because a little, little, that little horn doesn't think about itself as being all that little because it defiantly speaks boastful words. It acts and it speaks as if it is God and, and that it has sovereign power and has sovereign, sovereign might and power over the, over the earth. And we see that also t- today where secular nations today really do think that they have power and might and over the earth and can control all of mankind. And so this little horn, it, it acts and it speaks as if it is God as it has great power. It's also hostile to God. It opposes God in its great arrogance. That's what Daniel sees here on this earth. On the other hand, Daniel also sees a throne set up in heaven. And this is a permanent throne. On it sits the Ancient of Days, who is from everlasting. He's from everlasting, and he will be to everlasting. And that means that this is a kingdom whose, in which there will be no end. And so notice that Daniel sees this great contrast here between heaven and the earth. But the question is, so where is this connection between heaven and the earth? It almost seems as if what happens in heaven has no consequences at all for what happens here on this earth. Is heaven somehow completely separated from what happens on the earth? There in heaven you have one kingdom, here on earth you have kingdoms coming, and coming in one after the other, and there's no permanence. Well, that close connection between heaven and earth comes out in the vision at the end where Daniel sees one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And this one who is like a son of man, he comes and he approaches the ancient of days, the Lord God, and he's led into the presence of God. And his title, son of man, tells us that he is like one of us. He is a human being. And although he is a human being, just like us, Yet he is able on his own to come and to approach the throne of God. Well, think about that. That is unthinkable for a human being. For what human being, what creature can stand before the holy throne of God? A throne from which Daniel sees a river of fire flowing out before him? That means that there is no man who is holy or powerful enough to be able to approach the throne of God without being destroyed forever. Yet Daniel says, but I saw the Son of Man, one who is like one of us, a human being, approaching the throne of God, and he was not destroyed. And so something marvelous happens. For the Ancient of Days gives to the Son of Man, gives to him authority and glory and sovereign power. In fact, Daniel says, I see, I saw that all peoples, of, that I saw peoples of all nations, of every language, they came and, and they worshipped him. And his kingdom, well, the kingdom of the Son of Man is an everlasting kingdom that will not pass away and no one will destroy it, he says in verse 14 of this vision. And so you notice in this vision that there is a contrast then between the earthly kingdoms here and with the kingdom of the Son of Man in heaven. Earthly kingdoms, they rise and they fall, but the kingdom of the Son of Man will last forever. And so God already reveals uh, through his prophet Daniel that the Son of Man, he will come. And when he comes, he will raise up an eternal kingdom here on this earth. And so let's come back again to the Lord Jesus standing there before the court. The Lord Jesus says to Caiaphas and he says uh, to the leaders of Israel who are judging him. This prophecy of Daniel is now being fulfilled through me. I am that son of man that Daniel was speaking about. Today, as I stand here before your earthly court, I may appear to be weak to you. You may see me today in humility. You may see my suffering. You may see my shame. And soon you're going to see me die on the cursed cross, and you'll see me buried in the grave. I am that Son of Man who comes in weakness and humility. But understand full well 
that through my weakness and through my suffering and through my death, I will be exalted. For through my humiliation, I will earn the right to approach the throne of the ancient of days. Notice what's going on here, beloved. What Christ is doing is he is proclaiming in the midst of his suffering his victory. His enemies want to put him to death, but Christ already proclaims that from now on, not just as the translation in our NIV translation has in the future, but he says, no, literally from now on, you will see me sitting at the right hand of the mighty one. Well, you know that later on, the apostle John uh, sees how this prophecy uh, and these words of the Lord Jesus, actually, how these words of the Lord Jesus is fulfilled in a vision that God gives to him in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 John, in a vision, sees the Lord God seated on his throne in heaven, like Daniel did in his vision. But here the Lord God is holding in his hand a scroll, a scroll that is sealed, sealed shut. And a mighty angel, he hears a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice throughout the heavens and throughout the earth, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? Well, John says there was no one in heaven or on earth found who was worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll. Well, first of all, a little background here. We need to understand what the scroll represents. You know that the scroll here represents the history of uh, this world. And so the one who can break the seal and who can open the scroll is also the one who has the authority and the, and the power to rule over the earth and to direct the history of this world. But there was no one who was found who could, could do that. And so John says, I wept and I wept and I wept because there was no one worthy uh, to uh, open the scroll and to direct the history of this world. And then... And then he says, but then one of the elders spoke to me and said, John, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then John says, and then I saw, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. And only this lamb who was slain on the cross is worthy to approach the throne of God. He is worthy, he alone is worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God and to open those seals. And then in heaven, John says, then in heaven I heard uh, uh, that the people there, that they sang a new song in verse 9. And they sang this new song with these words, you talking about the lamb, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And they sang in a loud voice in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You notice in this vision, John now sees the crucified Lord Jesus enter into heaven at the time of his ascension. And there John sees in the vision that he is given the place of honor at the right hand of God to rule over all things. And it's through this vision, beloved, that the Lord God gives to us a blessed assurance that our Lord Jesus has indeed received the authority and the power to rule over all things in this world. That he is the one who has complete control over the history of all of mankind, but also over the history of our lives. The wonderful gospel message here is that he has come, the Lord Jesus has come, he's broken the vicious cycle of this world. A world that stands in rebellion against the great ruler who is seated there at the right hand of God. All the kingdoms of, the, of this world, they will all pass away. But the Lord Jesus, beloved, the Lord Jesus has established a new kingdom, a kingdom that is permanent, a kingdom that is everlasting, a kingdom in which we today also as God's people may find our peace, and we find our security. Here we need to 
also understand what kind of kingdom the Lord Jesus has brought about. We can say that his kingdom today is a, a, has a spiritual nature. We know that when the kingdom come, comes in his last day, uh, then there will also be a physical component to it. It will be placed here on this earth. But today, it is still a spiritual in nature. Remember that just before the Lord Jesus uh, ascended up into heaven, and he said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he says to his disciples, he says, all authority, not at all authority, is in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what does Christ do with that authority that's been given to him? He goes and he commands his disciples, he says, and when I go to heaven, I command you to go and to make disciples of all nations. They are to go and they are to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that means, beloved, that Christ's kingdom, the kingdom that he sets up here on this earth, is not political in nature. It's a kingdom that will transcend all the kingdoms and all the nations of this world. Well, how? Well, he will establish his eternal rule in the hearts and in the lives of his people. You see, one of the great benefits of the Lord Jesus seated at the right hand of God is, is that he receives also authority from his Father to, to send the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit might come and dwell in our hearts and might rule our hearts. You see, here again, you have this great contrast. The kingdoms of this world, they establish their rule. How? They establish their, their rule through the use of swords and guns and weapons. You see, also to, to, to today, as our secular uh, society and as our government today is promoting its own agenda, they even want to control the very things that people say and think and how uh, we think about certain things. And if we refuse, uh, they will then either fine us or they may send us in prison or they might make the life of the people of this nation very difficult un unless we submit to uh, their will. That's how the governments of this world, how they enforce uh, their rule over the people that are under them stands in sharp contrast to the kingdom uh, of God. Where God's kingdom is established. How? Yes, through a sword. But what kind of sword? The sword is the word and the sword is the spirit uh, that penetrates to the very depth of the soul. That means, beloved, that Christ's spirit renews our hearts. It means that the spirit comes and he creates in us a new desire so that we do not need to be forced to serve Jesus Christ as king, but that we now serve him as king with a heart that is in love for him, a heart that desires to, uh, to serve him and that longs uh, to live forever in the kingdom of our God because we know him as a loving God, a God whom we may trust, a God who will care for us for eternity. Now Jesus also says to the Sanhedrin, that the one who is now seated at the right hand of the mighty one, he is coming on the clouds of heaven. But in the Old Testament, clouds were often associated with God's presence. Remember at Mount Sinai, when the people of Israel uh, stood there in front of the mountain. And the Lord God then, then appeared to his people in the clouds on the mountain. It was an impressive sight. It was a means by which God and also reveals, I am present with you. Uh, there are also other instances, too. The cloud that went before Israel revealed the presence of God. The cloud that came on the tent of meeting, that cloud was a, a symbol that God was also present with his people there at the tent of meeting. But clouds in the Old Testament were also associated with God's great day of judgment. And so the prophet Joel, for example, he speaks about the day of judgment as the day, uh, the, as a day uh, he speaks about the day of judgment that is coming as a day of of clouds, a day of clouds. And there, there are about three or four other instances in the Old Testament where the day of judgment is referred to as a day of clouds. And so you can be sure that these leaders of Israel uh, understood what the Lord Jesus was saying. They understood that the Lord Jesus was saying that, he, that when he comes on the clouds of heaven, that he's saying, I come as the great judge of heaven and earth. I will also stand there as your judge. And so you can understand why Caiaphas was furious with the Lord Jesus. For he claims that they will see him, the Jews will see him coming to, to judge them on the great day of judgment. 
How dare he? Doesn't he know that he's been placed on trial before them? That they have already judged that he's worthy of death? That he is deserving of God's eternal judgment? And here is this man, Jesus Christ, who declares that he will come one day to judge all of their actions. The Lord Jesus says this because they need to understand that they are putting to death the one who will again come in glory on the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead. And when the Lord Jesus returns, then the people of Israel, together with all the people of all mankind, all mankind will have to answer for what they have done to the Son of Man when we put him to death. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 gives this warning. It says, look, he, as the Lord Jesus, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. In other words, it truly will happen that the Lord Jesus will return, and those who have pierced him, they will also see him return. Why, you know, those leaders of Israel who have pierced the Lord Jesus on the cross, they will see him return on the clouds of heaven with their own eyes. And when he comes, Jesus says that, then they will mourn for what they have done. But it will be too late. For they stand condemned together with all those who refuse to believe the Son of Man to be the Savior of the world sent by God. When Christ returns, it will be terrible for all those who have refused to serve him and to submit to his will. And therefore, beloved, this warning is not just here for the leaders of Israel if somehow these people uh, who are judging him are worse than than we are today or other people are today. Understand that Christ's warning is also directed to us and and directed to our lives. For when he will return on the clouds of heaven, well, we don't know that day. Jesus himself says when he comes, he will come in an hour that we do not expect him. And so the warning then that he also gives is that we need to be ready to meet our Lord always, every single moment of our lives. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven, then we need to be prepared to meet our Lord. And then we may ask ourselves also today, if he were to come now, if he were to come today or tomorrow or this next week, how will he find you? Will he find me in a place that will cause me shame and assure my eternal condemnation? Will he maybe find me drunk at a party? Will he maybe find me preoccupied with the pursuit of material things, that those are the most, impo- most important things that in my life today and that I'm pursuing and kind of leaving God out of the picture, out of my life? Will he maybe find me indulging in, sex- in sensual pleasures of so the flesh? Will he find me with a heart that is full of bitterness, and anger against my brother or my sister or against my neighbor? Well, he may be fine that my heart is full of bitterness against the Lord God himself because of the things that I have to bear in this life, and I blame the Lord God for those hardships and the suffering in my life. Beloved, as we, we think about the Lord Jesus, who, who is seated at the right hand of God, rules over all things, but we also think that he's the one who will come back as the judge. That also needs to give to us today that motivation to examine the condition of our own hearts. And keep in mind, as we examine our lives, that the Lord does not expect any of us to be perfect. The Lord knows we're sinners. He understands the struggle that each one of us has, also in our hearts, with sin. And so we don't need to fear the return of our Lord to Jesus because we are struggling with sin in our hearts and our lives. But what we need to fear is this. We must fear his return if we have hardened our hearts against him. 
We need to fear his return if, if we have rebelled against his will and we refuse to repent and we refuse to submit our life to his good rule. Oh, there are many times when, when we may have fallen and we may have fallen into sin and, and we have grieved as a result. Beloved, when we grieve our sins, we do not need to fear our judge. But if there is no grief for our sin, when there is no repentance, no desire to turn away from our sin, well, of course, then we do need to fear the one who will come as the judge of heaven and earth. But when there is a joyful submission to our Lord Jesus as our Savior, then we, do not, then we do not need to fear the return of our Lord. Then we may indeed, we may even be confident that when he comes, he will also deliver me from this life of misery. And he will give to me that joyous life there in his kingdom. Kingdom that is without end, that is permanent. What a joy for us that, to also know already today that our Savior has come and He has delivered us from the everlasting, or He has delivered us from that seething sea of humanity that is in constant turmoil, in which there is no security, in which there is no peace, and where only one kingdom destroys the next kingdom. Daniel sees in, in chapter 7, verse 11, in his vision that the Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven. When he comes on the clouds of heaven, he comes to, to judge. And when he comes in that vision, what does Daniel see? Daniel sees the great beast is slain, and his body is destroyed, and it is thrown into the blazing fire of God's judgment. That day will be a terrible day for the enemies of Christ. In fact, Revelation tells us that day they will call on the mountains and on the rocks to, to fall on them, on them and to cover them. And they will cry out, cover us from the wrath of the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ. Now, there's no peace. There's only horrible suffering, eternal judgment for those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. On the other hand, beloved, for those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus, who look to Him as their Savior, when the Lord Jesus comes, then you may be assured of this that he will then also give to you the tranquility of his kingdom, a kingdom that will be a kingdom of eternal peace. And that's why today we can already look up to heaven where our Lord Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, and there we await uh, for our great judge, Jesus Christ, to, to come on the clouds. Because when he comes, beloved, then he also promised that he, will, that he will take me and he will take all his chosen ones, he'll take all of his people to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Amen. Amen.